My name's Dr Alex Newbury and I'm a senior lecturer here in law and within the Crohn Research Group my research interests are in relation to young people um, and particularly youth offending and so I did um, a doctorate uh, at the University of Sussex looking at youth offending, restorative justice and um, young offenders and their attitudes to their offending behaviour and particularly to restorative justice and the, and the victim of the crime. And looking at how successful a restorative impact was on preventing reoffending and on changing attitudes of the young person to their offending and to victims and so hopefully prevent recidivism, reoffending. From that research which was um, looking at 41 young offenders who I interviewed um, face to face um, at the beginning and end of their orders, we, I found that alcohol was a very significant issue and particularly along gender lines it was quite interesting that the split, that the female young offenders owned the impact alcohol had had on their offending and would um, realise that alcohol, as they put it, made all their demons come out, uh, one young person said to me. And whereas the male young offenders tended to minimise the impact alcohol had had and attribute offending to things like settling a score or being very angry or having a fight with somebody in a, a rival gang. That interest over alcohol spurred another piece of research which I did in collaboration with um, Professor Gavin Dingwall at Leicester, at De Montfort University in Leicester and Professor Amina Memon, who is a psychologist at Royal Holloway. I was PI on an ESRC bid to look at, um, put the bid forward, for funding to look at how young people um, could be educated better, because the, the education at school is relatively patchy, in some places very good, uh, but in other places quite patchy in actually the impact of alcohol and the consequences of it and that maybe a more gendered approach to it would be a good way forward. Restorative justice is an interesting concept because it has quite a, 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 a long theoretical basis to it and it started, or arguably it started, with more kind of family type conferencing that was in a more community-based approach and some people trace the roots back to New Zealand and to indigenous people in Canada with, with sort of family circles and a, a conferencing circle where the community dealt with justice. But this is actually now perhaps transmogrified and moved forward quite a lot in the way we interpret it and use it and certainly the way it's been used in youth justice in England and Wales where um, it was introduced under New Labour in 2002 um, with, restore, with, with, with referral orders. And they brought forward the key issues of restorative justice being reintegration, reparation and restoration. So they mean reintegration that the offender is reintegrated back into community and also it can be argued that that can be also useful for the victim, that if they have felt so harmed by the attack um, they feel reintegrated back into a sense of community by meeting the offender and being able to deal with the harms that have occurred and voice and have a voice. Reparation meaning some level of repair, um, so that might be something like in the old style community service, but it's more rather than a being con with a punishment kind of theory, it's about a repair kind of theory. So that might be something like cleaning up graffiti, but it might be something actually directly for the victim if they wish to be involved. So in one case I had, the young offender actually went and cleaned and tidied up for the victim. Restoration is restoring the victim um, in, into community. So the idea of community repair and reintegration. A further area, which in a way for me is bringing my research full circle and is quite a departure from um, alcohol and young people, but is looking at litigants in person in the family courts. Um, and I, prior to becoming an academic, was a um, family law solicitor and I practised for about 10 years. And in that time, 
the, the numbers of people going into the courts who are actually representing themselves because they were una unable to get legal funding was just beginning 10 years ago. It's now become really quite a significant issue with a lot of people not getting funding. And so this, I think, is an area that, that, that currently is relatively under-researched, but is a very important area. I'm collaborating with a colleague at the University of Bath, um, Dr Sarah Moore, who is a sociologist. And so it's going to be an interdisciplinary approach, looking at both the legal and the sociological aspects of this. Three key areas we want to look at are the potential injustice that it can lead to for both parties, both the fact that the litigant in person, the person who's representing himself, may not have the knowledge of the law, but that they may also the person who is represented may perceive that there is an imbalance because they are being given more help and support because they don't have that knowledge. But therefore that can lead to potential conflicts for barristers or solicitors who are representing and for the judges. And so we are interested in doing qualitative research with that group about their perceptions of the impact of litigants in person in the court and also in relation to procedure and timing. And also, particularly in relation to family law, it's often dealing with extremely um, emotional and personal issues. And so it becomes an incredibly difficult issue for people to represent themselves in court. And so a very important area sociologically for there to be more research upon.